I grew up on a farm in rural America, and my brother and I used to spend hours and hours in our backyard digging in the sand. My mother would come out and she would say, if you just dig deep enough, you'll end up in China. <laughs> and fortunately, I did get to China to do a project 18 years ago, and I didn't have to tear up my mother's yard to do it. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm here to talk about Shenton D, the project that brought me here. And I think everybody knows that Shenton D is an extraordinary commercial success. And for that reason, I'm not going to talk about why it's a success, because those that, are you, that have been there and those that will you go there will see why it's a success, at least on a commercial level. I'm much more interested in another level, and that's why I think Shinton D is not only commercially important, but culturally important. When I was five years old, my mother and I waited on a school bus. And that school bus was to take me to my first day in public school. And she told me, she said, Ben, you will ride the school bus with friends of yours from our neighborhood, but not all your friends will be on that bus, not the colored ones. So it was my first lesson in humanity. And Shinton D was created for a rising middle class post revolutionary Shanghai population. And what we gave them was exactly what they didn't know they needed it needed at the time when they needed it the most. We gave the people of Shanghai a place where they could enjoy life and the dignity inherent in social equality. Forty-five years later, I was in my Boston studio working on a $2 billion renovation of a home for the Chicago Bears, uh, 65,000 seats. And then I got a call that made a big turn in my career. The call was from Vincent Lowe, a Hong Kong developer. And he said he had a project in the heart of Shanghai, and he wanted to create a world-class destination for dining and shopping and entertainment. And he said he wanted to do something unique, something that would call attention to the historical importance of that neighborhood. He said he had an airline ticket for me, leaving the next day. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm never one to turn down a great adventure. So I, two days later, <laughs> I find myself in this place, Shinton D. This is what it looked like in 1998. And I walked 10 blocks from my hotel room to this neighborhood. And as I approached the neighborhood, other than noticing some terribly run-down, overcrowded buildings, I smelled something. It turns out it was the smell of sewage. These people were living without indoor plumbing. And I noticed behind the door to every residential apartment, there was a pot. <laughs> and I later found out it was for night soil. And then I had to be told what night soil was. <laughs> and so that was really my cultural introduction to China in 1998. It's come a long way, of course. Um, but back then, there were 1,600 families living on this block. And when someone didn't move, the government took their roof off and they moved anyway. <laughs> and the other thing that I found amusing was that, um, and by the way, I didn't find the, getting the roof off amusing at all, um, but I, do, I did notice that behind, the, next to the night soil, was a, a wash basin. Behind, every apartment had one. And they, they didn't have the handles on the cold water. They didn't have any hot water, but they had cold water, and there were no handles. And I asked my guide, I said, where are the handles? And he said, they're in the pocket of the people that live there. <laughs> you, can, you can tell where somebody lives by what their handle on their faucet looks like. <laughs> you know what changed my... start? Well, at least it started me to think, was that there was life everywhere. There were children playing in the lanes. This is 7 o'clock in the morning, and the children, the small children, who weren't old enough to go to school, were playing in the lanes and the alleyways. And their grandparents were up to watch them. And then the parents were leaving the, these humble 
actually decaying relics. But they were well dressed, and they were clean. I looked at the buildings, and I looked underneath all the layers of the ad hoc additions and all the ways they had tried to eke more space out of these dwellings, and I noticed some very elegant brick buildings. And I noticed beautiful stone details, beautiful wood windows, beautiful wood doors. And I said at that moment, I need to find a way to save these buildings. The next day, I went to see Vincent Lowe and his board of directors in Hong Kong. It was a day of interviews. And at the end of the day, I'm sitting there with four other architects in a little conference room, and a call comes down, and they said, Mr. Wood, M Mr. Lowe wants to see you in his penthouse office. I go up to see Vincent, and he said, Ben, you got the job. And he said, but you only got one vote. It was my vote. <laughs> and he said, you got my vote because you wanted to save the buildings. In uh, 1996, Vincent's company had been awarded a, a contract to redevelop 22 blocks in Shanghai. And it was on two of those blocks that was the site of what would become one day Shenton D. And on one of those blocks was the first Congress hall of the Communist Party. In 1921, Chairman Mao and 11 other people had the first meeting of the Communist Party in China. And they did it here because it was in the French concession and it was a safe haven from the rest of Shanghai, which was where Chairman Mao was, would, have, would have been arrested had he been found. So there was some historical significance to the site that went beyond just the buildings. It was a, there was political, ideological significance to this neighborhood. So the next task, after having arrived in Shanghai, was what to do. How to take that neighborhood and turn it into a world-class entertainment destination. Uh, I have to admit, it was a struggle. <laughs> I mean, I was an American. I, knew, I didn't know the language. I'd never been to China. There was no, really, no one really I could talk to. Um, so I started to, I told, and we didn't have drawings. We didn't have drawings of any of the buildings. We didn't have time to do the drawings. So the first thing we did was we took thousands of photographs and we were able to get an aerial view. And this is the, the view of the North Block. And one of the most difficult decisions was which buildings to remove because I knew we had to make some public space. See, normally when an architect has a site, it's blank and they, they build public space by building buildings. In this case, I had to build public space by taking away buildings. And it was very difficult to decide which buildings to leave and which buildings to demolish and which buildings to change to make them commercially successful. But in the end, this is the diagram I came up with. And if you go to Shinton D, you'll recognize this as the main promenade. I also came up with a concept plan of how the place was, was to be used. And so I did more than just the architecture. I had to recruit the tenants. I had to find the restaurants. I went around, went to every bar and nightclub in Shanghai, and I said, I've got a great project. Please come. And then we did these photos. This is before we had SketchUp and a lot of these very sophisticated 3D modeling programs. So my team made all these photo collages, and we would overlay on the photo collage what we thought the place might look like when we were finished. And we did several of these. We'd take an old photograph that we took, and then we would overlay uh, commercial uh, venues and places to sit and landscaping. In this way, we were able to convince the, the government of Shanghai to let us go ahead with the project. And then there were some very dark days. <laughs> I mean, there was a day when I walked out and I said to myself, how are we ever going to get this place put back together? I mean, we, had, we ended up having demolished almost all the walls because of earthquake requirements. But every wall went back exactly where we tore it down. So when you go to Shinton Z today, the alleyways, the lanes are exactly the width and exactly the same place as they were when I went there in 1998. And then my partner from, Carl from Shanghai arrives, he's in this picture, he's standing on three feet of rubble, and he said, Ben, I'm from Ecuador. 
I got out of a third world country. Why are you in one? <laughs> and I said, I'm here because China won't always be a third world country. <laughs> and he, went, he got on the next plane and went home, never to come back. He never forgave me for using our resources on this project. <laughs> and then as we approached our first opening, which was in the late, the year 2001, we got to the point where we could open the North Alley. When, it, when Shinton D opened, I wouldn't say it was an instant success, but it was more like it wasn't an instant failure. But over the next few months, as we opened more and more shops, more restaurants, more cafes, more nightclubs, more bars, people by the thousands started to come to Shinton D. And I think they came there not because we had restored old buildings. I think they came there because it was part of their city and they remembered when it was something else. And these old buildings in this neighborhood had stories to tell. And they could bring their friends from out of town and tell them the stories of what it was and now look at what it is. So they took ownership of this place. The other reason they liked this place is it wasn't a shopping mall. Today, when you go to a big shopping mall, you have to... The first thing you see is a, what I call a phalanx of luxury brand flagship stores. And you have to navigate your way by Gucci and Versace and all these famous brands just to get to a shop where you want to buy a simple pair of shoes. And so what distinguished Shinton D was, was a collection of ordinary buildings for ordinary people. And I think people appreciated that. And it wasn't glass curtain walls framed in 50 shades of gray, which is what every high rise is. They're all gray, they're all glass. <laughs> they have no character. <laughs> the other thing I think Shinton D achieved was it it demonstrated that no building should ever make you feel humble. So it opened and it was, it was a place that was architecturally distinguished. It had a history and it had a texture and it had stories. And it wasn't used as a symbol of power. When you use, like the government, every building they built is a symbol of power. And when you use an, a building to symbolize power, you, the architecture corrupts. And in turn, the architecture itself is corrupted. So when I gathered my colleagues around the studio to talk about how you would design a beautiful romantic alfresco dining area in Shinton D, they looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? The only public space in my hometown was a treeless plaza used to celebrate government-sponsored events. And at the apex of that plaza was a great monumental government building. If you've ever studied music, you may know that sometimes it's harder to play the space between the notes than the notes themselves. And I think for me, who did study music, the notes of the music they're the, and the sound of the music and the space between them are the architecture of music. So I think Shinton D was the first place in a post-cultural revolution society of a rising middle class where people in Shanghai could go and hear and see a place they could wander in and out and they could shout in the street. They could shout by making apparent what choices they made about how they lived. They were literally creating culture at the same time they were consuming it. And they did all this without permission from the Cultural Bureau or the Ministry of Propaganda or the Licensing Bureau. They did it themselves. And that's why I'm enlightened to see all these people here because you're going to change the culture of China. And it's not up to the government, it's up to you. I asked Vincent once, he has these wings on his logo. 
I said, well, Vincent, what inspired you to put wings on your company logo? And he said, it was a book about a seagull who was not content sitting around eating fish heads. It was a seagull who believed that he who flies highest sees the furthest. For me, that recalcitrant disruptor of a seagull named Jonathan Livingston signified that no bird soars in a calm. And the Wright brothers write about this phenomenon. It was, to be a pioneer in aviation was incredibly difficult. And to actually design Shinton D, at least for me, was extraordinarily difficult. And so we had to use whatever we could do. We, we begged, we borrowed, and we stole ideas. You know, Steve Jobs said his best ideas are the one he stole from somebody. <laughs> so I think that you can be a critic of the gentrification of Shanghai, you can be a critic of the commercialization of a historic neighborhood, but Shinton D did change China. And it changed it by holding out a promise of a better life in a better city. And I think, for me, no one should have to wait for social injustice disguised as a school bus to steal away their opportunity to discover the beauty and joy inherent in humane architecture. You know, a city is like a bar, or a great city is like a great bar. It was Hemingway who said, I go to a bar not to get drunk, I go to a bar to stay drunk. <laughs> And when I was in Cuba a couple of weeks ago, I went to every bar that I knew that Hemingway had visited. And the one thing all these bars had in common were they were full of characters who told great stories about their city. It reminds me that, that we who live in cities, those same cities live in us. They are us. And so if you visit Chinton D, I hope you will visit my bar. And I'll tell you one of my stories about being here for 18 years, and I hope you will share one of your stories with me. For it's those stories and those ideas that I get from other people that give me new ideas for what I do. Thank you very much.